Louise Bedford here, your host of the Mind Over Market segment. This is how traders think. This week, we're going to talk about drawdown dilemmas and strategies for success. Now, I have got my business partner in our business, tradinggame.com.au, Mr. Christopher Tate, to help explore this arena. Now, Chris, welcome to the show. Morning. Now, let me give you a more official introduction. Mr. Christopher Tate, you have been such a long-term trader since the 80s. It has been fantastic to see. You are the author of at least three books, but there are more, I know. The one that we co-authored with Dr. Harry Stanton is Let the Trade Winds Flow. Now, that's a terrific book on psychology, but you've also been recognised as a best-selling author for The Art of Options Trading in Australia and The Art of Trading, which was actually Australia's very first book produced on the stock market. So this has been terrific because you've been able to influence so many people. We are co-founders, co-directors of tradinggame.com.au and this is our 24-year repeat for free mentor program. You can see here if you're looking along in the video that that is something that both Chris and I hold dear. It is the longest running mentor program for traders in the world. And because it's repeat for free, we've had people repeat that again and again and again. Now, I want to talk about drawdown. This is often a fragile time for traders when they're starting to make losses. What sort of indications can people use to show that they are in drawdown and that they are about to go into drawdown? I think there's, there's probably two things to unpack first. And that is that drawdown comes in as, as a function of two things. One is it can occur naturally as a function of the law of large numbers. People don't understand that irrespective of the hit rate of their system, they will get a series of losses just as a function of the statistics that govern that natural system. And so they need to be aware that that's a thing. The second aspect is that it could possibly be that your trading system is home to Mr. and Mrs. Cockup and it just doesn't work, but you need to be able to have a mechanism of delineating between the two. And the only way you can delineate between the two is to understand whether your system has a positive expectancy or an edge. Once you understand that you have an edge, you understand that sooner or later, you will run into this cluster, just as you have clusters of wins, you will have a cluster of losses. It's a little bit like the notion of, if you map tossing a coin tens of thousands of times, strangely enough, it looks like a share chart because you get clustering of heads, clustering of tails, clustering of heads, and then you get periods where there's volatility and just noise. And so it's understanding that distinction between the two. But it's also understanding something that's quite cruel about trading, and that is that the moment you start trading, your system will go into drawdown. Why does it do that? It does that because you take your losses first. And that, that is quite dispiriting to new traders who go, but I should make money from day one. I've been told they make money from day one. No, that's not the way the world functions. Because what happens is that, let's say you've got 10 trades, Five you kill instantly because they're losers, they have generated a loss. You don't have a profit yet because you've got nothing closed on the other five. And so you have to understand that drawdown is a natural function of all trading. It comes about simply because of the way systems function, because of the way you generate your returns, but it can also unfortunately be generated from the fact that you simply have no idea what you're doing. Yes. And that's the world on a wall. And what are the emotions that traders go through when they're in a period of drawdown? I think there's two. And they run contrary to one another. One is despair. You just think, well, God, I can't do this. This is, this is simply too hard. And everyone goes through that. You go through periods, even as someone has traded forever, where you think, I can't even buy a winning trade. Like, what the hell? But for 
perhaps less experienced traders, the other emotion they experience is a desire for revenge and they revenge trade. And in doing so, they make it worse, which generates more despair, more revenge. Worse. So you get this awful feedback loop that people get caught in. And the only way it is broken is either by them having a cathartic moment where they realize what they're doing or they wipe the account out. Then they sit back, I think, either think about what they've been doing and start fresh with new eyes and a new approach, or they simply let history repeat itself again. And then that can actually impact on how they feel about themselves as a person as well. Often, if you are in a drawdown situation, you start thinking that not only with trading are you useless, but in other areas, you're useless as well. It has a ripple effect. So, people associate their sense of self-worth with their equity curve. Mm. The moment you can divorce yourself from that is the moment that I would say trading becomes easy because it never is. It loses some of the internal friction. It creates problems. So how do we measure drawdown? Drawdown in simple terms is the peak to trough movement in your equity curve. But this presupposes that you are actually measuring your equity curve. Very few people do. Uh, very uh, People's record keeping for their trading by and large, but the general population is very, very poor. They don't actually know where they sit in the curve of their profitability of their business. And this is particularly true if they are in drawdown. They, they, there is this very human notion of, if I don't look at the account statements, then they're not real. And that, that's, that's a very human thing. I, when I was a broker, I knew traders and floor traders who would put their account statements in the drawer because if you don't look at it, it's not real. And so you have to have this mechanism of measuring your equity. And that's generally done by unit price. The unfortunate mistake people make is that they will simply look at the amount of money that is in the account. You might think that would work. That would work that is if the account never experiences inflows and outflows of cash. Because let, let's use an example. If you start the year with $100,000 and at the end of the year, you've got 130000 you think, well, I've made 30%. But what happens if you put 25,000 in in October? You've actually made less than 5%. And this is a problem that people don't account for. And it's actually, it is quite a complex thing to account for the time value of money within an account, which is why we always opt for a unit value. It's why managed funds opt for a unit value. It is just so much easier to manage and track. You don't have to do all these fancy and annoying calculations. And there's a famous group, the Beardstown Ladies. And how were they evaluating their own success in the markets? The, the Beardstown Ladies were quite celebrities. They were this sort of, let, let's just say, typical Midwest American Country Women's Association is probably the, the closest thing we've got here in Australia, where they would get together for a bit of a bake-off and a knitting fest. And they, they started investing in the market and they became national celebrities because when their results were presented, it appeared that they were outperforming the market and outperforming everybody else. Uh, somebody then who's a bit of a party pooper went along and went, well, look, you're just not calculating your results correctly. Or what you're actually doing is not taking account of the fact that you're adding money to the account. You're assuming that the money you have added to the account is your profit. Not true. Turns out at the end of the day, despite having gone on the speaking circuit, produced a book, and done all these wonderful things and been on TV, that they were actually underperforming the market. Damn. It's, a simple accounting error. it's just a simple accounting error. Yeah, absolutely. So how much of a loss is too much of a loss in a particular trade? Oh, look, if you go by some of the idiots that appear on LinkedIn, uh, who claim that they never have a losing trade, I would say any loss. But for the groundless among us in the audience, all, all losses are defined by a predetermined amount of risk. And, and we talk about risking 0.5%, 1%, 2% on a trade. That's not the capital allocation. That's the mistake many people make. Your percentage risk is the starting point for the capital allocation uh, calculation. But 
your loss should always be that predetermined amount. It should not be beyond that. If you have a position that is generated courtesy of using, let's say, 1% of your account to formulate a trade, and that trade rips 10% out of your account, there's something wrong with what you're doing. And that thing might be that you are not adhering to your stops at all. Mm. Or maybe if you haven't been looking at your position sizing as well, that can be another catch. And what about across an entire portfolio? If you look at all of the losses as they add up across all of the positions in your portfolio, how much of a loss is too much of a loss in that situation? There's very, very few harsh rules in finance, but there is one that is desperately, desperately cruel. And that is that a 10% loss cannot be made up by a 10% gain. It takes 11.1%. When you take 25, 25, 33, 50, 100, 100, it, you're screwed. You need to always keep that in the back of your mind. And so what we do is we work on this notion of portfolio heat, which is maximum exposure over an entire portfolio. And what it literally says is, it asks the question, what is the most pain I can bear if every new position I put into the market at once simultaneously had their stops hit and I was knocked out? So it is at once a reflection of your pain point. It's also a reflection of that reality that once you're chasing losses and they've gotten out of hand, it's very, very difficult to get back onto the front foot. And so when you look at your portfolio, so let's assume you've got a series of portfolios that's treat them as a business because it is a business, not a hobby, it's like what people think. A hobby is something you pay to do. A business is something that pays you. There is a sharp divide between the two. We need to say, right, my pain point is 10% because I know, based upon the prior experience I've had and the returns my account generates, that I can cope with that both from a emotional perspective. I can take the hit and keep going. The system can take the hit and go, yes, we've now drawn down 10% in an incident. I know that over the coming time period, I re- I can recover that and work my way out of it and up and go. And this is one of the problems I think people face is they don't understand that equity pairs are not linear. They don't start at the bottom left of your screen and proceed to the top right in a straight line. And they're somewhat of a roller coaster and they have ebbs and flows. And you have to be able to deal with the ebbs and flows. I think a lot of people have trouble at the extreme of those ebbs and flows. So when they're making a load of money, that can set off some warning bells in their psyche, but as well as when they're losing money, that can set off warning bells as well. So those extremes are where we need to rely on the support of a mentor or somebody who has actually seen that process before. I think beginners in particular have trouble with drawdown, Chris. Why would that be? It's simply because it's inexperience. It, it's simply inexperience. It, it is just the way it is. It's a little bit like the first time you do an open water swim in the cold without a wetsuit in the winter here in Melbourne. You get in the water and go, dear God, I think my testicles have disappeared. It is just... It is the shock of the unknown, so you don't have the emotional resilience to deal with what's occurring. In part, there is this sort of emotional contagion that people absorb from the internet that gives the impression that you never have losing trades. You only ever make money because that's what the market does. You turn the screen on and money pours out of it. That's not what happens. I, I understand that is the social media view, but it is not the reality of running a business. When you run a business, uh, there are good times to be making widgets and there are bad times to be making widgets. That's just the way business works. And trading is no different. Trading is no different to running a restaurant where you will have periods during the week where they're very, very flat, where you actually lose money because there's more staff than customers. But at the weekend, you will be flat chat because you simply can't keep up. 
Trading's, trading's no different. I think what happens is people lose sight of the fact that trading is a business. And so it operates under all the constraints that all businesses operate under. And that is, it is dependent upon your emotional resilience, the state of the market you deal with, your skill at dealing with your business, with all these things stuck together. Mm. I want to get back to your earlier comment about how every system loses money initially. I remember at one stage, you and I were looking through some systems from others who have generated them. And then we went, that's a fake and that's a fake, but that's probably a genuine system. Mm. Can you talk about how to spot a fake system based on an equity curve and looking at drawdown? Yeah, there's a few things to look at. And what is intriguing is that you would think that LinkedIn being a professional sort of aspect of social media would be immune to this, but LinkedIn is simply Facebook people with a job. And I, I, at least once a week, will see someone put up an equity curve that is clearly fake. And you can tell it's fake quite easily because it initially does not go into drawdown. It has vast numbers of winning trades one after another, which is simply not statistical in any way, shape or form. It is impossible, as some systems I've seen claim, to get 98% of all the trades right and to only have a losing streak of two losing trades in a row. So if you look at the equity curve, it should dip. And it should not be this lovely, clean trajectory upwards. That's not how the world works. But when you look at the stats at the bottom of it, you can see that they're clearly fake because they're outside the boundaries of what you would humanly expect. It's a little bit like, let's use an analogy from lifting. It's a little bit like 15-year-old teenagers who claim that they're going to the gym and they squat. 275 kilograms for reps. And you go, mate, you weigh 65 kilograms. This would make you functionally the strongest person on the planet. It's simply not true. Show me and I'll believe you. Trading's the same. You get people who pretend all the time. And it is very, very problematic for people who don't have the experience and therefore the discernment to go, well, that's nonsense. Because I know from experience that you know, when you start a business, you don't make money from day one because you've got all the outgoings of establishing the business. Trading's a little bit the same. You have all the outgoings from establishing the trading system by the fact that your trades hit their losses first and fall away, leaving you with a loss. It, it, it's, it's, there is a delineation between the world of the grown-up and the world of the child. And that delineation is not based upon chronological age most of the time. <laughs> Absolutely. I think there's also a difference between people going through a portfolio drawdown where they've lost money overall and people who are having a cluster because you can hit 10 trades in a row that you lose, but you're not losing overall enough of an amount to raise those alarm bells. What do you think would be the differences emotionally for people in those two types of category of drawdown? I think if you're getting it wrong everywhere over all time frames in all markets, it's actually telling you a story. And the story is there's something wrong with the system or there's something wrong with your interaction. Yes, there are times when all asset prices go flat and you think, hell, this is like bonus. But by and large, when it all goes horribly wrong everywhere, it's generally your fault. It, it's generally something you're doing. There's a problem with the system. It's generating friction somewhere. Or there's a problem with your interaction with the system and it's generating friction somewhere. And unfortunately, it's difficult for people to see that themselves. You actually need a tap on the shoulder for someone to look at things and go, look, you're just not doing that right. That's wrong. That's different from if you've got part of the system where all of a sudden it's just begun to churn. That's a systematic problem. That's a problem to do with the system. It's not global. Global problems are very problematic and potentially disastrous. 
But mm. systematic ones are just a matter of going, well, I'm either in a cluster or I'm just slightly out of rhythm and out of kilter, and that will come back. It's, it's very rare that that sort of cluster is problematic in the long term. Yes, absolutely. And is there a way to prevent drawdown before it begins? Oh, that's easy. Don't trade. But this... There you go. I've solved that. What's the next question you've got? That was a good one. <laughs> that was, wasn't it? That's a good answer. Right, that was a brilliant answer. Look, it's, there's, there is no way to prevent drawdown, not, none whatsoever. It, it's just the way of the world. It, what, once you begin to trade, you begin to engage this amorphous mass the market, which has all these random perturbations that you're attempting to get on the right side of. And as I said earlier, irrespective of your win rate, sooner or later you will get on the wrong side of it several times in a row and the system will draw down. The only way to avoid drawdown is don't trade. Just stay at home, put money in the bank, you'll be fine. Unfortunately, because risk and reward are immutably interlinked, you'll get no reward for that, but then you don't deserve any reward for that if you've taken no risk. It's a completely riskless trade. You won't get a drawdown other than inflation, but you won't make anything. So this is normal. It's a normal part of trading. It's to be expected. It's something that you can premeditate how you'll react before it happens to you. So that is a method that I think can work really well. The pre-mortem method. So you imagine a bad circumstance and then you say, okay, what can I do in advance to be able to work out how I'll feel when that bad circumstance happens and some strategies to be able to either not let it happen or to recover. So that pre-mortem method, I think, is an absolute winner. So let's think about how we can get back into the market after we've had a loss. I think it can knock people. That's when we're likely to see people quit. That's when people decide that this isn't for me and they take up a Jim Smowing franchise. So what can you do to emotionally recover after you've made a loss? I think the functional answer for both how to prepare for drawdown before it occurs and how to deal with it once it is occurring is this notion of reducing trade size. Get small just get smaller and smaller and smaller. I've had periods when I've come back in my career, I've gone down to trading one lot or part of a lot. Where you just aim to get the rhythm back, aim to get the functional aspects of doing the analysis, putting the trade on, managing the emotions. And because the amounts are so small, they're meaningless. I did a video a few weeks ago about my performance in a particular system for last year. And my solution to Part of the solution for dealing with that this year is to get small for that particular system, and it stayed small. And that enables you to get this very, very gradual sort of acclimatization and to get back into the game. And the same is true when you've had a drawdown. If, if you're not measuring your equity curve, the equity curves have peaks and troughs. They look like share charts. Simplest thing to do is run a moving average through it. When your equity curve is above the moving average, get big because you're in a cluster of wins. When the equity curve is below the moving average, get small because you're in a cluster of losses and you need to survive that and work your way out of it. And just just let time and the system do its thing. The unfortunate thing is that people try and blast their way out of a drawdown by going big at the wrong time. And they will attempt to go big partway through the drawdown. And all this does is accelerate the drawdown. It just makes it worse. So is that the way that you can trade your way out of a drawdown? Just keep getting smaller and smaller? Small. Yeah, yeah. And in your experience, when is it the death knell? Is it when you have decided that, okay, this is no longer my game, this isn't for me, it's time for me to quit because I can't do this because my drawdown is too extreme. Is that when traders decide objectively to quit? How do you know when this isn't your game? 
I, I think it's generally when their wife finds out that they've blown the school fees mm-hmm. and the decision is forced upon them. Unfortunately, people make the decision. Can everybody, we come back to that eternal question, can everybody trade? Yes and no. And it, 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 you sit on the horns of a dilemma because it, the answer is both yes and no. Everybody has the intellectual capacity to trade because despite what people will try and tell you, it's not rocket science. Never has been, never will be. Uh, if you can, you know, get the clock on your microwave to work, then you're you have enough intellectual horsepower to trade. Problem is most people don't have sufficient emotional horsepower. People are very poor at emotional control. They're very poor at self-reflection. I came across a study last year. It was quite disturbing in that it found that people would rather, have, this is, it, it sounds like I'm making it up, and how they put it past the ethics committee, I have no idea. People would prefer the notion of having electrodes attached to their genitals than sitting in silence for themse- by themselves for eight minutes. That, that's, that's where society has now come to in terms of its capacity to reflect and to engage in self-reflection. It is only traders who are capable of engaging in self-reflection and asking, what part did I play in this? What was my role? What did I do who were able to take that step back and work out what went wrong, regroup, reorganize, go again? And one of the things you note, one of the books I insist that all of our traders have is Market Wizards. Everybody in that blew up initially. And then they started again because it is that initial blowing up, I think, that knocks sense into people. So they either decide it's not for them, which is a valid decision, perfectly valid decision. Go off and do real estate or something else. Get a Jim's mowing franchise, buy Brumbies, do something else. Or they've got sufficient self-awareness to sit down and go, I did that. How did I do that? Why did I do that? Because excessive drawdown from my observation is an expression of self-destruction. The market will grant you the wish to do anything you want. If you wish to toast yourself, it will say, have at it. I will allow you to do that. I'll even show you how. And that is why that continual upgrading of your psychological fitness is so important. Making sure that you follow videos and audios like this, really working on yourself as hard as you do your trading plan. And I want to finish on this point. There is another person sometimes involved in this transaction, and it is a spouse if you happen to be trading with a spouse alongside. That spouse can be very threatened by drawdown. So I do suggest that you put an if-then statement into your trading plan. So if I draw down 25% or more in my equity curve, then I will stop entering new positions. I will stop going into areas that make me feel like, okay, I'm unfamiliar with this, so that you're going to stick to the things that you know, you'll exit on the stops of the positions that you're already in. And, and this is a big and, you'll consult a higher authority. So I know, Chris, you and I are down in a lot of people's trading plans to act as that higher authority. And we do take that with a lot of honour with this. So it is definitely an honor to be listed as somebody else's higher authority. Now, Chris, any parting words of advice? We are out of time. And how can people get in touch with you? Drawdown is a thing. It is a natural thing. There is no way to avoid it. There is no way around it. Uh, At the risk of being politically incorrect, you just have to suck it up, princess, and deal with it. You either deal with it by self-reflection, by looking at what you're doing, or you deal with it by leaving. It's as simple as that. And if people can touch base with me at tradinggame.com.au, you can catch me at chris at artoftrading.com.au. Follow along with my blog. You can catch me on Twitter. 
Fantastic. Chris, as always, such a fascinating world of knowledge and information. I do appreciate you being my business partner for so many years, and it is an absolute honor working with you. So until next week, happy trading. Thanks.